Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Friday, June the 7th, 2024. It is currently 3.02 p.m. Central Time, and I am coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. Now, I often tell people that there are really different Christianities, right? There is the Christianity that is sold. It is the Christianity that that the church, in a sense, it's like an info commercial. We we promise all kinds of things. We make all kinds of claims. It's, It's the Christianity that we sell. It's the info commercial Christianity. There is the Christianity that everyone pretends to have and experience. Oh, this is, this is what I have and this is what I'm experiencing and I'm this and I'm that and I have this and God is doing this and God is doing that. And I think a lot of that is just pretending because then you have the third cast. So you have the info commercial, you have the pretend, and then I think you have the reality of Christianity and it's very different than the info commercial and radically different than whatever everyone, everyone pretends that they are experiencing and that they have. There is a reality to it. And that reality is so different than the info commercial and so different what people are pretending that if you come to the realization of the reality that is actually there, it can cause you major problems in your faith. I think it can cause a crisis of faith. You're like, wait a minute, this isn't what was sold to me. And why isn't my experience what everyone else is running around claiming to be experiencing? Because I've never experienced that. And you can start questioning Christianity. I think in another way, there is a, and I, th- that's an illustration and I explain it that way over and over and over. I've been doing that for a long time. But if I want to expand on that, I think there is a Christianity that we we'll call it a theoretical Christianity, right? A theoretical Christianity. It's the Christianity of the seminary classroom. It's the Christianity of a Bible college on a Saturday morning. It's the Christianity of being together with people in a small group. It's the Christianity of being in a beautiful sanctuary, right? That, that it, it's all theoretical in the sense that you're there. You may be hearing a beautiful hymn. It is well with my soul. You may be hearing someone preach a profound sermon that really touches you and, and motivates you and challenges you and convicts you. It may be just a, a time of maybe you're in a church service and it's a candlelight service and, and, and it's very somber, somber and, and you feel this deep emotion. You feel connected to God. It, it feels powerful. It feels beautiful and you never want it to end. Maybe it's the, the Christianity of a revival service or the Christianity of, of, you know, I don't, you alone with a Bible and a notebook, uh, maybe on a retreat or you just spending time alone with God and you feel, you feel God's presence. You feel close to God. And it, maybe it's a, an experiential, theoretical kind of Christianity. And probably anyone who's been a Christian for any length of time, you've experienced that, right? You've, you've experienced times like that where you're just like, oh, I don't, like, I don't need anything else in the world. It's just me and God and everything seems perfect and wonderful. And it seems like the birds are singing, the sun is out and everything is wonderful and great. And it's just, you feel close to God. You don't feel any guilt or shame. Everything seems perfect. Perfect, right? And, and and I think people long for that, and people try to recreate those experiences, and they want that. And 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 it's it's so easy to be sitting here in this studio, right? Sitting here in this studio, just alone, a Bible, a notebook. I can be reading scripture and thinking about it, and talking to it with myself, to myself. Maybe even turn on the microphone and talk to you, and and just be going, oh, this could mean this, and this could mean this, and 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 it just seems so. Everything seems so true and everything seems so obvious and everything seems so perfect. And and it's like, why would anyone ever question this? Why would anyone ever doubt this? It's kind of the, the world of a theoretical, experiential Christianity. But at some point, you got to leave the seminary classroom. 
You got to leave the revival service. You got to leave the small group. You got to leave that being alone in that room with a Bible and a notebook and, and praying to God and everything seems right. Sooner or later, you've got to open the door and walk back into the real world. And when you open the door and walk into the real world, you are confronted with a world that doesn't feel so right. Everything seems so wrong. Like there is death and murder and, and rape and child molestation and, and, and crime and deceit and just, you just name it, sin, lust, adultery, fornication, pornography, just go on and on and on and on. Everything, embezzlements, murder, mugging, stabbings, robbery, you just, you could just add to the list. You know what the world is out there. And it's so radically different than when you're just sitting in the seminary classroom or the Bible college or, and you're just reading the Bible like, oh, this makes so much sense. This is so, this, this is the way it is. But when you walk into the world, it's almost like, like you walk into the world and it's like, boom, you get hit in the side of the head. Boom, boom, boom. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. And now you're like, wait a minute. It, it's not, it's not so, can I go back to that theoretical, almost experiential where everything's perfect? Because this real world is, is, is so different. And it's the same thing with my first illustration, like the info commercial and what everyone pretends. When you get hit with what the reality of your Christian life is, once again, you can kind of go, well, I just, I just want that info commercial. I just want it to be so simple and, and everything's so perfect. But you find out it's not that way. Now, yesterday was one of those days where I think everyone should at least felt a little bit of a slap in the face. A little bit. Maybe more than a slap. Maybe, a, you know, an elbow to the side of the head. Maybe maybe a baseball bat to the side of the head. It, it, it should have had some kind of impact on you. But I think for most people, they, they're not too bothered by it. But I, well, I'm still bothered by it. See, yesterday was June the 6th. It was the anniversary of D-Day, because on June the 6th, 1944, more than 160,000 Allied troops landed along a 50-mile stretch of heavily fortified French coastline to fight Nazi Germany on the beaches of Normandy, France. More than 5,000 ships and 13,000 aircraft supported the D-Day invasion, and by day's end, the Allies gained a foothold in continental Europe. The cost in lives on D-Day was high. More than 9,000 Allied soldiers were killed or wounded. But their sacrifice allowed more than 100,000 soldiers to begin a slow, hard slog across Europe to defeat Adolf Hitler's troops. Now that invasion and the horrors of it and the death and, and everything about it just makes you start questioning what, you know, when I'm just sitting there reading my Bible, everything seems perfect. Everything is, is wonderful. I may feel like I've got all the right answers. Everything is, seems so simple. It's like believe in God and everything just is so, it's just, there's no difficulty. But then when you open the door and you're like, wait a minute, today is, Jan is June the 6th. I remember what happened on June the 6th, 1944. That is horrible. And it starts raising hard questions about war and death. So yesterday, we spent some time trying to remember it, all right? I played three hours of original radio broadcast that aired starting around midnight on June the 6th, all the way till, I don't know, we made it around eight or nine o'clock in the morning of that coverage. And, and it was interesting. It was fascinating. It said a lot about how culture has changed, how news media has changed. I think there was a lot of powerful lessons in it. I don't know how many people listened to everything. I had 24 hours of audio I could play. Um, and I, I finally made the decision I'll probably just stop right there because I think we we kind of got an overall feel for what happened. I still think it's interesting and fascinating. And well, for me, if you have a subscription to Sirius XM satellite radio, though now they uh, you know have an app. If you subscribe even to just the app, you don't need the satellite radio, just the app. Um, 
you can go to Radio Classics and then you can look for their on-demand content. And they have multiple hours of radio broadcasts from D-Day. And, and you can really just get a sense of it. But the more I listen to it and just, oh, just trying to imagine what it must have felt like going through all, going through the entire war. You know, the, it, it must have been, the war began, what, 1938, 1939? And just, you know, year after year and everything that occurred. And it's just like, ah. and so by the time I kind of got done with that, then I thought, you know, it's, you know, D-Day is about to end. It was getting late. And I'm like, I'll watch the movie Saving Private Ryan. I've seen it multiple times. It By many, it's considered one of the greatest movies ever made. And the opening battle sequence showing D-Day, uh, the I think the invasion on Omaha Beach, um, so, you know, many veterans uh, had said it's one of the most realistic uh depictions of what it was like coming onto that beach and uh that how you know like so many of them could not watch it they were almost traumatized by it and and you've i've read many of the accounts of the making of the movie and the people that they consulted and and you know yeah there, there's some brutality in it showing how ugly all of it was just and when you just watch it by the end i mean i i mean i look i cry in that movie i cry at the beginning i cry in the middle i cry at the end I cry throughout the movie because it's just, it just tears me apart. Like, it's just how horrible it was. And sometimes we forget, you know, June the 6th, 1944 did not end the war. The war didn't, like, you know, it's June the 7th and everybody just moved. Well, yesterday was D-Day celebration. Let's move on. Well, for the men in 1944, it didn't end on June the 7th. The war continued all the way to September 1945. That war was far from over. And when it was over, World War II was the deadliest military conflict in history. And estimated, just try to wrap your mind around this. Just try to wrap your mind around this. A total of 70 to 85 million people perished. Try to wrap your mind around that. Somewhere between 70 and 85 million people perished in World War II. That was about 3% of the estimated global population of 2.3 billion in 1940. Something like 3% of the total population perished during that war. Between 70 and 85 million people. Just, I can't even wrap my mind. You want to feel like it's the end of the world? You want to feel like the apocalypse is here? That the, the world is coming to an end? That all the Bible prophecy about the end of the world? You, it had to feel like the total end of the world. It had to. I don't even know how you, I don't even know. Like I, in our culture today, one little thing happens. The next thing you know, everyone's losing their minds and it's the end of the world and people got to write books and we're, we're all going to die and everything. Can you imagine if 70 to 85 million people were perishing? Well, in our culture, there would be someone going, it's not true. It's not real. Nobody's dying. Show me the pictures. I want to see the death certificates. You would, it would just turn into conspiracy theories in, in 2024 because everybody has lost their ever living mind. Okay. But yes, I can't even, I can't even wrap my mind around that. So again, sitting here, sitting in a church, sitting in a small group, everyone's praying and I pray for you, brother. I pray for you, sister. And, and, oh yes, I love you as a brother in Christ. I love you as a sister in Christ and everything. Let's sing a praise chorus and, and, oh, this, and let's read a scripture and, oh, oh, amen and amen. And, and, oh, let's light some candles or let's sing some hymns or let's, let's have a week of, of revival services, whatever. Like that, that, that world it is one thing, but when you are like, oh, in the meantime, World War II just happened to be the deadliest war ever, and 70 to 85 million people died. It's like, it's hard. how do you reconcile those two worlds? How do you reconcile reconcile those two worlds? The worlds of just sitting in church, you know, it's Friday, it's a fast approaching Friday evening. Before you know, it'll be Sunday morning. You're going to get up with your family, you know? Nice. Everybody looks really nice. Got your Sunday best on. You're going to go sit in church. 
There's going to be some prayer. You're going to sing some songs. You're going to talk about the goodness and the mercy and the love of God. You may hear sermons about his attributes. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He is the almighty God, our rock, our shield, our deliverer. And everybody will be like, amen. Oh, that was a beautiful message, pastor. You so encouraged my soul. Oh, praise God. Praise God. And everybody, it's great. But how do you reconcile that experience with 70 to 85 million people dying in one war? I don't know. I can't reconcile it. Now, if I can forget about all of that and I can just sit here with my Bible, reading scripture, studying scripture, trying to figure it out, being convicted about my own sin, my own shortcomings, my own failure. I mean, that can be maddening enough, right? Why do I keep sinning? Why do I keep thinking about this? Why do I, you know, know, I got to deal with my own sin. That I I have a hard enough time reconciling that with, you know, okay, God, can you help me out here? But wow, when I stop to consider something like D-Day and everything about World War II, So how do you reconcile it? What do you do with that? What do you do with the fact that 70, 85 million people died in World War II? How do you reconcile what happened on October the 7th in Israel while over a thousand people were were slaughtered? How do you reconcile what's happening in Gaza? How do you reconcile what's going on in, in Ukraine? Because if you listen to the average everyday Christian, and we've done this lately in our looking at some of the podcasts that are topping the Spotify podcasting charts. I mean, it's all like God said, God said this and God did this and God intervened here and God spoke to me here and God did this and God did this and God did this and God did this and God did that and God did this. Christians constantly talk that way. God spoke to me. God did this and God said this and God intervened here and God did this for us and God did this and this, this. And like you, you would think God is just active in everyone's life 24-7. He's talking to people, doing things, revealing things, working this out, working that out, fixing this problem, solving that problem. Well, all of that is going on. Well, then how do you reconcile God supposedly involved in every little detail with this woman was raped and this child was molested and this person was kidnapped and they can't find this person because they've gone missing and this has happened and and spousal abuse i mean if you don't if you don't if you want to know what the world sounds like p- please download a police scanner app i beg you before because there, there's a lot of talk that they're going to basically start blocking police scanners so that nobody will be able to monitor them but until that happens download a police scanner app some of them is two dollars three dollars a month and just pr- start picking a b- police scanner feeds on a Friday night. Just listen, listen to Chicago, Indianapolis. That one's great. That's a crazy police scanner feed. Just choose random ones and it'll be this call and this call and violence and crime and, and abuse and this and that and, and death. And it's like, it's, it's horrible. It's hor- It's like, how do I reconcile that? With, with all the Christian talk that God's here and God's here and God's here and God's doing this and God's doing, it's like, well, if God's doing all these things, could he just make a city safe for one night, one, one Friday night? Just no one gets hurt. No one gets killed. There's no death. But obviously we know it doesn't work that way. How do we reconcile that? Now, you, you raise these questions, Christians get defensive, and they'll come back and they'll throw your typical apologetics out there, you know, that, and they think they, they, they always act like that they're so pious and smart. And, and, you know, the reason anyone has these questions is because basically we don't, you know, you've never read your Bible or you're dumb or like they, they just become condescending, arrogant jerks instead of going, maybe, maybe there's some real questions here. I mean, Take the fact that 70 to 85 million people died in World War II. Just take, take that fact. We won't even get into all the other wars and, and all the horrible things that have happened in, in human history. But take that with two of God's attributes. Omnipotence. And omnipresence. Now, we, 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 sh- we could throw in omniscience. Go ahead and throw in those three attributes. Omnipotence, all-powerful. Omniscience, all-knowing. And omnipresent, present everywhere at all times. Take those three attributes. 
God is all powerful, meaning he can do whatever he wants. He's omniscient. He knows everything from the beginning to the end and omnipresent. He's present everywhere at all times. Take those three attributes and then how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile what's going to happen on a Friday night tonight somewhere? Horrible things are going to happen tonight somewhere. I guarantee you there's going to be death. There's going to be crime. Horrible things are going to happen tonight in cities and towns all across this country. Now, God knows it's going to happen. He's all powerful. He could stop it from happening. And he's already present. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Now this verse emphasizes God's almighty power. I am God Almighty. God himself speaks of his almighty, his power. That's Genesis 17.1. The King James, it reads this way. Genesis 17.1. Genesis 17.1. Genesis 17.1 here, if I can get there. And when Abram was 99, uh, 99 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. He's the almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. He's all powerful. Jeremiah 32, 17. Jeremiah 32, 17. Jeremiah 32, 17. We read these words. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Uh, other translations translates that verse, Gen- or Jeremiah thirty two seventeen this way. Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Jeremiah acknowledges God's power in creation and his ability to do the impossible. Matthew nineteen twenty six. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Jesus affirms God's unlimited power to accomplish what seems impossible to humans. God is almighty. He is creator of heaven and earth. All things are possible with him. Now you take that. How do you reconcile this all power? Powerful God with all the horrors, not only of World War II, of life. How do you reconcile that? What do you do with that in your mind? Now, I, I know you really have two go-to answers, right? What The first go-to answer is the omniscient, all-knowing God, knowing exactly how it was going to play out decided I'm going to create people. He didn't need to. He created people knowing exactly what was going to happen, knowing they were going to sin, and then knowing that every person would be born with a sinful nature. And then he let it play out. And I know our go-to is, well, free will, free will, free will. Well, first of all, if people are truly free, then they can't have a sinful nature. Right, So you have to go to Pelagianism, or at least some form of semi-Pelagianism, to argue that the, the depravity of man does not impact their will. Well, that's a major problem, right? If, 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 ever, if, if even lost people, if depravity does not impact their will, then you would have to believe that even lost people could keep God's law perfectly without salvation, because their will is absolutely free. They could freely choose to just obey God perfectly because they do not have a sinful nature that would in, that would do anything to cause problems with it. Well, that's a major issue. And that's why Pelagius believed that people could be perfect because he did not believe in the impact of the sinful nature on, on people. So that's, a, that's, that's already problematic. But even if you do that, why would God, knowing exactly what was going to happen, then just allow free will to run rapid so there's death, 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 destruction, pain, suffering, death, pain, and, and not ever intervene. Well, there's clearly times in the Bible he intervened. Clearly, right? So if he would intervene and use his omnipotence in those situations, why not in all the other situations? 
It's not such an easy. I know, I know Christians love to find these easy answers. And then we walk around thinking almost condescending that we're not willing to really embrace this difficulty. There's a difficulty here. God is, God is, he's omniscient. He knows all things, but I mean, he's omnipotent. He can do anything. Now we can say he can do anything that is consistent, obviously, with his holiness. I mean, I know we can get into all the technicalities of omnipotence, but the point is, you know, he can intervene. He can stop it. And he can intervene in a way that we would not even witness it or see it. Like he can enter, he doesn't have to intervene like with the parting of the Red Sea and plagues. He can, he can intervene in situations in such a small way that we don't even see or perceive that God is doing anything. But he obviously didn't intervene when 70 to 85 million people were perishing. A lot of people will say, well, on D-Day, the weather conditions were perfect. The weather conditions were perfect for that invasion. And if the weather conditions would have been wrong, the whole invasion would have failed and, and the whole outcome of the war. And many people say, see, God intervened. I'm like, wait a minute. So God intervened there. <laughs> he didn't intervene to stop the slaughter of 70 to 85 million people, but he intervened. It's really weird where they'll be, God intervened here. You're like, well, why wouldn't God do this or this or this? Or this? It's so, it's so odd the way people talk about that. Like if, if, if there's a storm and, and uh, you're, you're spared, you're like, God intervened and God protected us. I'm like, the people three houses down all died. So God didn't protect them? Well, no, he didn't. Okay, so I guess that's okay. That At three houses down, a, a four-year-old died. Well, I mean, you know, too bad. God protected us. So praise God. <laughs> it's all great. Christians sometimes don't even think of the, of the way it comes across. So God is omnipotent. Now, we don't even have a problem with his um, omnipresence. That's pretty That's pretty straightforward. We can read about it in Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, starting in verse 7. Psalm 139, verse 7. Whether shall I go uh, from thy spirit or whether shall I free from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I make the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. In other words, I can't get, I can't get away from God. God is everywhere. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. How do you reconcile that? Again, one of the answers is somehow say free will, but free will just requires so, it just, it's not really an answer because now the omniscient God, the omnipotent God knows exactly what's going to happen. So then, so what is it? God just is free will and he just steps back and doesn't ever intervene or does anything that because he cannot violate someone's free will. Like how does... And again, if man's will is really free, then you're saying they don't have a sinful nature. And if you say, well, they have a sinful nature, but it doesn't impact the will, then what is then what, is, what do you mean having a sinful nature then? That just raises so many theological questions. Now, we ran into another problem because depending on your theological background, your church may have a doctrinal statement that reads something like this. This is from the London Baptist Confession. 1689, God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever comes to pass. So according to the London Baptist Confession of Faith, God from all eternity, by his most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, he has decreed all things 
whatsoever comes to pass, whatever comes to pass, God decreed freely, nothing making him do so, nothing influencing his decision. He, whatever comes to pass, God decreed. Well, that would be 70 to 85 million people dying. Yet, the London Baptist then tries to, to try to help with this. Yet so as thereby, and yet so as thereby is God neither the author of sin, nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established, in which appears his wisdom and disposing all things, power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. Basically like, look, God decrees everything, but, but he's not the author of sin. Because then they say secondary causes. So God doesn't, he doesn't cause it, but he, in a, a sense, decrees it. But if he decreed it, does it not have to have, oh, it becomes all complicated and convoluted. And you can, you'll talk yourself into circles trying to figure that out. What many people do, and it's typically men, shrug their shoulders and go, well, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. I don't care. I move on. He's like, oh, you, 70, 85 million people. And you just shrug your shoulders. and like, yeah, whatever. God can do whatever he wants. And it's usually younger guys who do this, talking such bravado and like, yeah, God can do whatever he wants. I don't care. Yeah, you don't care until someone in your family is kidnapped or, or raped. And then all of a sudden, maybe you'll have a different uh, opinion. It's easy to talk a big game. Once again, sitting in church, talking a big game. But I, I think everyone should be like, well, how does this work? Now, if you say God doesn't decree all things that come to pass, well, now then you kind of move into like, well, then God is not all knowing or... God is not omnipotent. You almost begin to destroy who God is. So then you run into a problem there. How do we work this out in our mind? In the beginning, God, Genesis 1-1, I say it all the time. That's the most complicated, convoluted, difficult, philosophically, will just melt your brain verse in the entire Bible. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you, as soon as he starts creating, you want to say, God, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, time out, time out. Can we have a time? Do you know what's about to happen? Do you know? Do you know the death, disease, crime, pain, and suffering that this creation is about to endure? Do you know this is going to, did you know this was going to happen when you created Satan, when you created Lucifer, when you created this angelic being and when he rebelled, why didn't you kill him? Why did you let him have access to your, the creation of man and woman? Why did you let him have access to Adam and Eve? And what's Adam and Eve's sin? Why didn't you just then wipe everyone? Get rid of Satan, get rid of Adam and Eve and just start over or just like, just let the animals roam your creation. And now some people will act like, well, God needed someone. He didn't need anything. If God needed something, then he's imperfect. There's perfect harmony, perfect unity, perfect fellowship within the Trinity. So then God creates people knowing what's going to happen. And then what happens? Well, they Adam and Eve sin, and then every person proceeding from them is born a sinner. So everyone has a sinful nature, which is only going to 100% guarantee nobody can keep God's law, and everyone's going to sin, 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 which the entire history of human of humankind is the history of sinful people carrying out horrible sinful deeds like, I don't know, the death of 70 to 85 million people in World War II. How do you reconcile this? Now, either one, people, this is the two attempts, really, in theology. Do everything in your power to get God off the hook. God didn't do this. It's not God's fault. God didn't do anything. He did everything he could, and it's all man's fault. And God, do not blame God. God has nothing to do with this. All right. And I guess that makes some people feel better 
God's off the hook. I don't know how you, I mean, everything goes back to God, right? If you believe Genesis 1-1, he's the creation of all things, and you believe the one creating knows all things, he knew exactly what was going to happen when he created. So then how do you get God off the hook there? You may not say he's the author of sin, but at the very least, you have to say he creating he created the world knowing exactly what was going to happen and did nothing to stop it. And you say, well, he gave them the law. But if everyone has a sinful nature, they cannot keep the law. So then that doesn't really fix the problem, does it? So you can, that's one attempt. It's really, uh, no matter how you verbalize it, it's basically an attempt to get God off the hook. And then second is, the second approach is really to just blame free will. Free will is the answer. Like just free will, that's the problem. Well, who who gave free will? If you're And again, if you're going to say free will, then you don't believe obviously that people are totally depraved or born with a sinful nature, which means now you're over in Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism, which is that's, now you're going to have a hard time explaining all the horrors in the world if no one has a sinful nature and that sinful that lost people could be perfect. Okay, now that's it. That system is so broken. That doesn't work. And then even if you say free will, who God, God gave them free will knowing exactly what they were going to do. So how does that really get God off the hook? Now you're going to ask me, how have you reconciled this? I don't know if I ever have. I don't know if there is an easy way to reconcile. I just know there are certain times where anniversaries come up that we remember horrible tragedies, horrible things, things related to World War II or things related to September the 11th, 2001 or Oklahoma City bombing or our, our you know, desert storm. Go, go to our invasion of Iraq later on in what, 2003, 2002, 2003. Then our, the war in Afghanistan, the war in terrorism, all the, I mean, there's so many things to remember, death and destruction, a pandemic, and not the first one and not will not be the last one. Obviously, there's been multiple pandemics in history. You can go look them up and see how many people died. How many people die every day from starvation? How many people die every day for a lack of, of clean drinking water? How many people die every day of, of all kinds of diseases? In many cases, there may be actual cures for the diseases, but people live in a part of the world where they don't have access to the medication to, to prevent said horrible diseases or cure said horrible diseases. How many people die every year because of crime? Now, again, when I'm just sitting here with my Bible, reading it, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in the mountains of his holiness. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Lord, I praise you for who you are. I praise you for your attributes. You say, what? I'm just sitting here in my room, just forget everything else. Then it's, it's it's so it can be peaceful and beautiful and calming and and great. But then when I walk out and go, great is the Lord, and I look around. Well, would the great God please do something with a world that's not been so great for a very long time? Now we believe ultimately He will return and make things right. But reconciling a God who knows every single detail before it even happens, who's present everywhere all the time, and who has the power to do anything, there's a part of you that has to acknowledge and accept somehow God has allowed this. And I don't have easy answers for you. Forget remembering horrible tragedy that happened in the 1940s. It's hard enough to reconcile about the horrible tragedies that's happened in your life that may happen this weekend or will happen in the future. I don't have any easy answers for you. I don't know how I reconcile it sometimes with my own suffering and tragedy in my own life in the past. 
or suffering what being witnessed in the present or whatever I will encounter in the future. I have a hard enough time reconciling it with my own sinful nature and my own sin. But it, this is a tension. This is a reality. If you believe in God, th- this is not something we hide. I know we don't like to talk about this in church because we like our little Disney answers, our little ha- Hallmark movie answers, so that everyone feels, oh, so encouraged, and it's so beautiful, and it's so wonderful. It, it's almost inevitable that you, you struggle. I mean, everyone's theology has built in answers to some of these problems because there's at least it's it's at least acknowledged by many that there's a need to try to answer this. What many Christians want is just find some simple answers and say that's good enough for me and then if someone stro- fights back or doesn't like their answer then they just get offended and say well if you just believed in God and if you just would read your Bible you would just know if you would just have faith and they, they get very offended if you say, I, your answers are kind of very simplistic to a very complicated problem. Now, I wish I had something profound to say here. I wish I, I did. I wish I could say, I know what scriptures say. Scriptures by no means back da- backs down from this controversy and this difficulty, right? The Bible, on one hand, shows horrible things happening page after page after page. In many cases, it's very clear that God is sovereignly involved, controlling, decreeing, like provident, like God is, God is definitely knows what's going on at the same time. And the same time, the Bible doesn't have any problem acknowledging God's omniscient, being all knowing, being all powerful, being present everywhere at the same time. It, the Bible, the Bible does not in any way shy away from this conflict, but at the same time, it doesn't necessarily give us an easy answer. The best we can have is Job suffered and he accepted that suffering coming from God. Job accepted God's involvement in his suffering. He didn't say, well, the devil's out there doing this to me. Well, the devil was involved, but God was the one controlling it. And what was God using? What's called a secondary source. He, he, he wasn't directly involved. He was allowing Satan to do it using a secondary source. That's, how, that's why that's mentioned in the London Baptist Confession of Faith. But it's still God controlling and driving it. Finally, Job gets sick of it all, asks some questions to God, and then God does not give him any answers. He just gives him questions. And then ultimately, Job is like, that's it, I'm going to be silent. Now, if you really think about it, that's kind of the biblical answer is on one hand, we acknowledge the pain and the suffering and and, and Job wasn't silent. He acknowledged it and expressed his pain loudly. That's what a spiritual lament is. A spiritual lament is a spiritual scream of pain. And it's okay to lament and say, God, I don't understand. I don't understand the pain and the suffering. I don't understand where you are. I think it's perfectly okay to do that. If you don't do that, you got to pretend. But at the same time, acknowledge, ultimately, I'm not the creator. That's not an easy answer. That's not going to, you know, ease your pain and your confusion. I wish I could just give you the, the, the simple answer. I could try to work out some simplistic answer that many Christian quote unquote apologists will, and it'll make you feel better because you'll feel like you somehow have some kind of, you know, intellectual superiority. But in many cases, it, it, it still will not embrace the reality that is right there in front of us. Maybe all we can do is just put our hands over our mouth and go, God, I'm not God, and I'm never going to understand so much of this. So when a day like D-Day comes and goes, the reality of pain and suffering doesn't. It's all around you. It's around you. Sometimes it will actually hit you. Sometimes it's going to get someone close to you. What do you do? You can email me at news if at yahoo.com.
That's newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. God bless.